Zirani, how did you feel when you first learned that your baby would be born different? Well, this was 30 years ago. So when I first saw the baby, I was very shocked. Mm-hmm. And um, I just, you know, c- couldn't believe uh, that I, I'm having a Clive baby. So I didn't really accept that it. It took me about a week to really, uh, you know, knock. There's a knock on my head saying that, okay, this is your baby. You have to take care of your baby. Uh, and then slowly I uh, came to the realization that uh, the baby needs me, so I need to really focus on getting fed and all those things. Mm-hmm. And at that time, there weren't a lot of feeding bottles around that could be used to help. And uh, the way I fed him was uh, by using a bot- uh, spoon, just a normal spoon. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, um, and I couldn't breastfeed him because he was born with a condition called the bilateral cleft lip and palate. Mm-hmm. And it was quite bad because the Palette, if you put your fingers through, it was nothing inside. You know, you can see the nostril area, the nasal area, yeah. So feeding was using formula and you just quickly spoon in from the bottle that you mix and just feed him. But he grew quite well (laughs) despite all challenges. This was 30 years ago, right? So now he's... Uh, uh, Correct. Now he's he's married, he's he's working, he's married, he's got a daughter now. You know, he's gone through the whole protocol of... Uh, doing the leap, the palate, and then he had to do bone grafting, what they call the bone grafting, where they take the bone marrow from the hip and put it in the gums because his gum was, the uh, upper gum was divided into three because it's a bilateral, there's two holes here and here. Right. Mm. So the first uh, alveolar bone grafting uh, wasn't successful because the gap was too big and not enough bone. So they had to do another one. But his his uh, child is okay. No, he has no. Yeah, yeah. With... He is. He's a lovely. He has a lovely daughter. Okay. So let me go back. Take you back for a bit. So you had this newborn baby. Up to that point, had you seen any other babies who had cleft lips or cleft palates? Mm, no, not not at that time. Because that time we were staying in Kerti, uh, in uh, Ranta Petronas Kerti. Really? It was like an a camp sort of for the oil and gas people then, right. and um. That was my first time seeing a class baby. And at that time, I felt quite shy going out, you know, mm. to show my baby to my friends because they know I was expecting and then mm. when the baby came. Uh, but they, uh, my family was very supportive and the neighbors were supportive too. And, um, but the thing in terms of treatment, we had to go to KL mm-hmm. uh, because uh, in Trunganu that time, they didn't, they didn't have uh, surgeons who could cater for a class baby. So we did uh, traveling from Kerti to KL every other month. And then his first surgery was done when he was uh, under two months old because of the, what, what he has was bilateral. So there's the center bit, the um, premaxilla, it was rotating up. So the doctor at that time, the doctor said, if we don't do it quickly, it's very hard for them to push it down. So uh, he went in into OT, he was about a month plus, but his weight was good because, you know, Mm -hmm. despite everything, he he was gaining weight. So um, that was the first surgery. The second surgery was to close the palate inside. Mm. The palate was done when he was 11 months old. And at that time, because he had hearing issue, because um, for a cleft baby, especially if there's cleft palate, it would affect the um, uh, middle ear because sometimes there's water in the middle ear. Right. It's because of the, of the eustachian tube that is um, weak for cleft babies. So he had to have a grommet. It's a grommet is a little tube that's inserted into the eardrum. What right, the okay. doctor do is the ENT will puncture the eardrum and put the grommet in. And the grommet is like a, a little a straw. It, mm-hmm. uh, the air from outside will go into the middle ear to dry the mm-hmm. ear and the water that's inside the middle ear will come out. But because it's a foreign body, mm-hmm. it will be rejected by the body after about two, three months. It comes out but on its own. So he had that inserted twice, I think. Right. And uh, he has issues on his left ears. He couldn't he- hear well, but you know, with treatment and all. Uh, it's okay now? It's okay, yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, okay. And because for cleft babies, uh, cleft palate babies especially, if they cannot hear, 
they cannot speak because babies uh, listen and they imitate you, then mm. they can speak, right? Mm. That's how baby learns how to speak. So, if if class talent babies, um, if the mothers don't know about the hearing issues, they might you know overlook that. And we have incidences that um, a class baby had to be put with hearing aids because you know the parents didn't know anything about. Uh, the the hearing part so they kind of neglect that bit so it's, it's quite sad because they can actually hear first but because of neglect mm. um the hearing issue comes in okay yeah so we, you know you sort of explained about um your feelings at the beginning of it but mm -hmm. what was your husband's reaction to to seeing his newborn baby his reaction <laughs> I never did ask him that. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but I think he was a great support. He, he, he handled it quite well. He gave me a lot of moral support and all. And uh, how, so how did you both, or what did you both have to do to process this news? I mean, you said, you know, it took you about a week. That's mm -hmm, yeah. a pretty fast turnaround. And then, you know, you were at it, spoon feeding and stuff. So, what did you both have to do to process this news in order to get on with being parents to your beautiful child? So, right, we, we talked about it, and then you know, you you because I have I have five children, and uh, Salman is my fourth child that's got the cleft. Mm. Uh, so at that time, he has the the three elder brothers. The younger one was about three years old or so. So you know. Uh, now that we have a baby, he needs this special attention because of his condition. Mm. So, you know, it's just mother's instinct that, you know, you have to do it no matter what. Okay. How did your other kids yeah. deal with it? How did they oh, they, 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 they were okay. They, I think they were, at that time, they were too young to understand. Mm -hmm. But they, they love him just as much as, you know, just like a normal baby, no right. issue. Mm. So, you know, when your baby was born, you had... Four kids already or three kids? No, no, already? three kids. Someone is my fourth. Okay. Yeah. So you had three children already. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have a baby who, who had extra needs that had to be met. Yeah. Um, of course, you, you've mentioned the feeding was, was one big challenge that you had to face. But what was the biggest challenge or the biggest set of challenges you had initially with this new baby? Well, I think at that time, you know, I, I said I sort of... Uh, blame myself for it. Uh, I was thinking, right. you know, maybe I would have, maybe I could have done something wrong when I was pregnant, you know, um, mm. some myth that, you know, you shouldn't be cutting chicken, la, this, uh, I don't know, yeah. I was blaming myself actually. Yeah. Um, I, th I think that's a heavy journey that a lot of yes, moms yeah. go through. Yeah. yeah. But, but the thing is, the most important thing is not to blame yourself. I mean, mm. it, you have to learn through. It, it, it took me about <laughs> 30 years now to really see uh, that it, of course you'll be shocked, but with the technology now, the, the mothers, they can detect the babies uh, as early as 15 weeks, 20 weeks mm. in vitro to see that they are carrying a class baby. And we have done a lot of antenatal counseling and I think it really helps them uh, to go through the pregnancy um, because they, they are more prepared. Unlike me, I wasn't prepared at all. Mm. And then self-blaming doesn't help uh, because you need, to, you need to go through and focus on your baby because your baby needs you. The baby doesn't know anything. So how did you do that? How did you tackle this challenge of this sort of self-loathing self and self-blame? Yeah. Um, because it's 30 years as ago, as you go along, yeah, that's 30 years ago, and we were in Kurte, and there was no internet at that time, no, you know, no books, uh, there's no part Google to us, <laughs> 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 and no Facebook, social media to you know, mm. to get information. But it's just from because we were lucky, um, we were staying in Ranta Petronas, and at that time. Um, there's this team of medical doctors that comes into uh, Kurti Clinic uh, from KL. And with their advice, we uh, got in touch with the surgeon in KL. So everything was done in KL. All right. But for you, though, I mean, like, at, at some point, you were, you were still very hard on yourself. Yeah. 
But how did how was it just I need to snap out of this or did you? Yeah, speak to so something about it? like that is just you know wake up, wake up. You know <laughs> he needs you that kind of thing. Yeah, right. okay. yeah. You 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 learn as you go along. I think. So thirty years ago, obviously mm-hmm. things are very were very different. Mm-hmm. Take mm-hmm. us through the medical options given to you by your child's doctor and the journey that you went in a sort of chronological way, so we can understand. Um, the what steps, hap- yeah, the steps that were happening then. Okay, um, in in our case, in Salman's case, um, we moved a lot. And we even went overseas. So what he has experienced would not apply to a normal baby uh, in uh, in a usual setting. But like I say, uh, at about uh, just under two months, he did his lip surgery. Uh, that was done in KL. And then at uh, 11 months, he did his um, palate surgery with the grommet insertion right. to the clear ear, right. the dra- uh, the dra- to drain the ear. And then um, we, I think we moved to KL when he was, um, he was, he, he was in standard five, uh, um, from standard one. When he was in, in KL, we were standard one. But between the age of uh, five to six years old, we did trips back and forth to KL for his speech therapy. Because at that time, he had, uh, even though the palate was closed, uh, there's some hypernasality that his speech wasn't clear. So we were going back and forth, Kerte, uh, KL, to do speech therapy because at that time, in Trungano, they don't have any speech therapists. So speech therapy... Uh, what, what they did was, uh, this lady, um, she gave me a bunch of homework to do. Uh, because we don't see her every month. It's mm. like maybe mm. three months we go down to see her. Right. So this bunch of homework, I need to sit down with Salman and uh, do speech therapy with him. What, what, what was the homework like? Uh, it, it's just saying uh, simple words because he's only five years old, right? Yeah. Right. So it's simple words like... Uh, uh, you know, reading uh, simple, like, uh, I can't actually exactly remember yeah, yeah. what the words are. It's yeah. simple words that children learn to speak. Mm. Uh, so if, when he goes to see the speech therapist, and if his pronunciation is not correct, I get scolded. All right. <laughs> because I didn't do my homework. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. so but, uh, but, but what I see nowadays, uh, mothers, uh, when they go see a speech therapist, they expect magic from the speech therapist therapist because that doesn't happen you have to do your homework with your child you know when you go bring a child see a speech therapist Mm. he or she is only there for about maybe half an hour to 45 minutes Mm -hmm. you're lucky if the child opens her mouth Mm. to to, because it's a stranger right the speech therapy is a stranger and usually the speech therapy will bring all kinds of toys to get the child to speak to you Mm. so um, if you expect your child to get perfect language, perfect speech, just by sending for speech therapy, it doesn't happen. You have to do your part as parents, mm. do your part at home. So mm. between five and six, mm. it was just speech therapy. Yeah, but speech therapy. When you, earlier you mentioned it was the, the first it was the lip uh-huh. and if the nose. It was all about the grafting earlier, right? No, no. The, the grafting was oh, yeah, done grafting. Uh, later on. The, the first, In fact, the first grafting was done when we... We were in the United States. Okay, let's let's go back yeah. to five or six <laughs> first. Five or six chronological yeah. thing, yeah. otherwise yeah. we'll get confused. Right. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so five or six speech therapy, and then what happened after that? Five and six, uh, and then we moved to KL. So when he entered Standard One, um, he with his friends and all, he he has no issue. Uh, so that the and he started uh, orthodontic work for for his teeth. Because uh, they were planning to do bone grafting then, but to do in order to do bone grafting, they need to uh, rearrange the, the teeth and expand the upper arch, upper jaw. So he started his uh, orthodontic work when he was seven years old. By end of standard, standard one, my husband got transferred uh, to the US uh, for his work. So we followed him. And we took all his folders, his medical records, his dental records with us to the States. And um, we managed to find 
we will stay in New Jersey, so we managed to find um, uh, an orthodontist there. And but for his bone grafting, we had to go to Washington DC at Fairfax Children Hospital. So it was done there. And then um, my husband got transferred after two years. I think he got transferred to Singapore. And in Singapore, um, when we moved to Singapore, he just did his bone grafting. And um, at that time, they used some mesh to support the bone marrow that they planted in the gums. And that mesh came off. It got stuck in the nostril. Uh, so we managed to find somebody in Singapore to help us out. And uh, in Singapore, he was actively doing his orthodontic work. And because he was in an American school setting, uh, what, what's good is they have speech therapy in-house. So that the children will get to call to go see speech therapy um, during school hours. So in, my, in, in Salman's case, when the speech therapy, speech therapist asked him, uh, why are you here? Oh, he said, I'm just here to learn English, that's it. You know, he didn't know that he was there to get his speech corrected and stuff like that. Which, which was good. He, he was quite a confident young man. Uh, but the thing is, when we were in Singapore, the speech therapist asked us, uh, do you ever mention to Salman his condition? Right? Uh, and um, uh, we said no. So uh, she told us, you should. So we, sh we have a, a baby album for Salman. Hello? Can you hear us? Uh, <laughs> not quite. Oh, we've been trying. <laughs> that's why I said you guys are doing this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, one moment, yeah. Hold on. I think there's a there's a there's a connection issue. I think you're not, you can't hear us. Okay, now you're good. You can hear us. Yeah. Okay, here. Okay, hold on one moment. So we have to start again. No, 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 no. no, no. <laughs> it's just... Hold on one moment. Uh, from orthodontic. Orthodontic in Singapore. Okay, cool. No. Okay. okay, so we we went to the America. Uh, this was during an American school and okay. uh, speech therapy and whatnot. So, so go back to the the age thing if you don't mind. Uh, yeah. So we just want to know in in America, yeah, okay. right? Okay. So in America, when he was going through this, um, how old was he then? In America, he was uh, eight eight years old. Right. Yeah. And then when you moved to Singapore and. Uh -huh. it, uh, he started to have the, the bone marrow, did you say he happened? The, the, the bone marrow uh, transplant, the ABG, alveolar bone grafting, was done. Uh, when he was coming to nine years old, we were still in Singapore, uh, in America because we went mm -hmm. to Washington, D.C. to get it done. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one of the best surgeons there, Craig Dufresne. And then um, we, when we moved to Singapore, his uh, ABG was like maybe two, three months post ABG. Mm -hmm. So when, when we were settling, settling in, still looking for a house to stay in Singapore, that's when we not, uh, I noticed that there was a mesh stuck in the, the nasal cavity. What do you mean a mesh was stuck there? Uh, a mesh is like a very tiny wire mesh. Yeah, right. They, they used it because uh, remember his uh, lip and palate, there's no... Uh, there's no roof. Uh, yep. Right, so it was like uh, so a it's a hole. So what right. they did during bone grafting uh, at that time, that is the procedure they used then. Mm. Uh, they put the mesh and then only they put the bone marrow to, right. to become to become uh, like the floor or the ceiling of, of the <laughs> yeah, yeah of the yeah. ceiling. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So so somehow it got dislodged because of the hole, right? So it got right. dislodged into the nasal cavity. But it didn't hurt him. He was like running around like no issue. Okay. So uh, what happened? I took it out. <laughs> I took the you mesh just put, You just plucked it out? <laughs> yeah, because... Oh it, God, I'm it, feeling all <laughs> gully now. <laughs> no, no, it's, it, no, there was no blood, nothing. Because it, I guess uh, the bone must have settled in, but the mesh sort of got uh, kicked out somehow. Oh, like like the grommet. Uh, yeah. Like the grommet, it got popped out. Right. Yeah. It don't need you anymore. Yeah. Nah, right. So, okay. but, but this thing was just hanging there <laughs> in the nostril. So, Gosh. I had to take it out and I brought it to see to the plastic surgeon in Singapore 
uh, and he helped us uh, uh, and he checked and he said that's fine and I think nothing uh, the, the boat is settling in and all but because the, the gap was very big he was advised to get another EBG done which we did when we came back to Malaysia a few years later because um, after Singapore, we went to Saudi Arabia. Oh my God, you've been everywhere. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, because um, um, my husband got transferred uh, and we stayed in Riyadh. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and during all this travel, uh, the kids were all in American school. So uh, they still have the speech therapist right, there. Okay, and all. Yeah, that, yeah. It, it, that's a wonder of American uh, setting. They have psychologists, they have speech therapists, they have the works there. Mm. And it's to serve the children. So uh, in, um, in Saudi Arabia, no surgeries. It's just follow up for his orthodontic work. Mm -hmm. So in Saudi Arabia, how old was he then? Uh, nine, ten, I think. Okay, okay. Yeah. So, um, and then, uh, you know, the Gulf War started. And then we had to, uh, our, the, the compound that we stayed got bombed. <laughs> just oh, a few, <laughs> a few kilometers away from where we're staying, and then uh, the company said, "Okay, guys, pack up and leave." So we came back to Malaysia. And then he <coughs> continued to have surgery and treatment in Malaysia. Sorry, can't hear you. He continued to have his surgery and treatment in Malaysia. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. When when we came, when we came back to Malaysia. Mm -hmm. Uh, we got, we looked for the orthodontist, remember when he was seven years old, yeah. he was seen by this orthodontist. Mm -hmm. We looked for her and she got us in touch with the team in, in KL. And that's when um, he got his second bone grafting done. And he was how old at that Eleven, age? Ten? Um, he was 12 then because when he came back, he was 12 years old. But uh, we came back in May, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, so UPSR was sometime September, right? So he didn't do his UPSR because he don't know anything <laughs> uh, regarding nation syllabus, right? right so, right. Um, but he did his bone grafting uh, at the age of twelve and end of uh, end of standard six. And so, what were sort of the sequence of the next lot of sort of surgeries that? Can't, can't really done? hear you. What was the next sequence of surgeries that he he done? After? Um, the bone grafting and uh, the second bone grafting was his final surgery. Mm -hmm. uh, because after that, um, they just the orthodontist just need to align his teeth and just uh, because he's done for 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 his treatment. Because what what happens was. For a cleft for cleft cases, sometimes the you know when when you do your uh, your upper jaw, uh, the the gums cannot cannot grow anymore. It gets restricted, right. and the lower jaw will grow forward. So they have what they call uh, a mal occlusion. They cannot bite properly. Yeah. But in Salman's case, his was his his the jaw was good. There's a harmony. He doesn't need what they call the jaw surgery, which is octonectic. Right. That is done for uh, cases where, uh, you know, there's, um, the bite is very bad. Mm -hmm. uh, and then um, they have to move the jaw, either move the lower jaw backwards or the upper jaw forward, depending on the case. So that is called octonectic surgery. It's done when the child has stopped growing. Because it cannot do before growth stops because you have to redo the thing all over again. So is that true for the other sort of aesthetic, more aesthetic operations that uh -huh. it sort of happens around sort of 17, 18 onwards when the child stops growing? Yep. Uh, when the child stops growing, they can do uh, rhinoplasty, you know, to make the nose look nicer, right. lip revision, right. uh, and uh, jaw movement is to make uh, the face look Harmony, mm -hmm. in, uh, it look as normal as can be, mm -hmm. and it, it's like um, for girls especially, it's like a cherry on top. You know, mm -hmm. do the rhinoplasty before they get married. So, so, did your son not get any done then? Did he? No, no. he said, "Look, mom, I'm handsome enough. I don't need any more surgeries." I like his. Attitude. <laughs> I like it. it okay, so yeah, what but was, but what was, what was your reservations as a mom 
knowing that your child, you know, from the first surgery when he was so tiny, uh -huh. um, and then subsequently each surgery after that, as a mum, how did you feel about, you know, the road ahead in terms of his surgeries and the, and the pain and the, the, the difficulties he's going to go through with these operations? Um, but going into, uh, when he goes into surgery, it's can be terrifying also because you don't know what's going to happen in the OT. Um, but so far, all his uh, post-op care was uneventful. He recovered very well. Again, I guess we had a good team of doctors. Um, but that was, uh, you know, some years back. For like now in Malaysia, we have a lot of hospitals, the government hospitals that uh, do com uh, cleft surgeries every other week. This was before COVID time, right? Uh, so, so they get regular operation days to do cleft surgeries. So when, 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 because I've been volunteering for Clapham for, since we came back from overseas since 2003, um, you know, I see a lot of changes in terms of how the, the cleft babies are being treated and all. So uh, when we tell mothers, you know, you just go to a government hospital uh, and they'll take care of you because they have a team there. You, you need a multidisciplinary team to take care of this baby. You cannot work alone on this baby. Did you so, wish but, 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 someone the, like the, you back sorry, then? I can't hear you. Did you wish that you had someone like you back when you were? <laughs> um, well, I, I didn't think about that then. But I think the, the, the parents nowadays are very lucky because they have Clapham uh, and uh, they have the, the internet. To help them, but but that's good and bad with the internet, because um, when I do um, antenatal counselling, uh, a lot of mothers they will have, when the doctors uh, diagnose that they they're carrying a baby, they will be crying their heart out, and you know, a lot of uh, stress and worry, and then they do research on the internet, and then, uh, but when they come see us, um. We, we explain step by step what they will go through. But the thing is, the baby is not out yet. So you don't really know how the condition is really. Mm. So we normally advise the mothers to just take care of the health, just enjoy the pregnancy and not think too much about, about Clef and no more research on internet. <laughs> what they know is enough. Yes, yes. I'm yeah. So and, and they are more prepared mentally and emotionally to face the baby when they come and they have the support system there yeah when it yes happens. and and uh we have special bottles um um i have it here oh, we, have <laughs> we have special bottles um that they can use uh and this bottle especially this one they can only get it from us from clapham uh, we don't sell it at the store because we don't want them to mark up the price and then you know the parents can't afford to buy it right uh, so they are fortunate in that sense. They have support uh, from us. In fact, uh, babies in Klang Valley, mm -hmm. if they are born with cleft, the mothers, once they are uh, okay to go back, they can go home, but the baby stays. Until a representative from Clapham comes to see the parents and do counselling, teach them about feeding, talk about the what to expect on uh, the protocol, there's a CLEF protocol that they need to follow. Like um, my son, uh, he followed through the, all, all the protocol that's needed to be done. Mm -hmm. Who was the one that actually led you through the protocol when it was, you know, your time? Oh, I didn't know there was a protocol then. I just, <laughs> I just oh, followed, you? <laughs> I just followed what the doctors told us to do. Okay, you have to do lift. And they come back and do pellet. You just learn as you go along. So even the feeding, you know, you yeah. Have uh -huh. in those days, um, was it at, at that time, I didn't know feeding. You have to prop up your baby a bit, like forty-five degrees up, right. uh, so to avoid the water going back into the middle ear. I didn't know that. Right. It was a, um, it was uh, when I started doing the voluntary work. Then I picked up here and there, uh, and I like to attend conferences, medical, dental, whatever conferences there are, and I will join. Uh, and learn from, from the right, doctors. Right. Okay, so, you know, 
it's hard enough for any mother to watch their child sort of go through tough times. Mm -hmm. How did you keep your, you know, son motivated uh, despite the pain and the, the, the really long road ahead? Yeah, the, the thing is, I think he has support from his other siblings. <laughs> so, it, and, he, and we treat him like, a, like his other brothers and sister. And, uh, and, and uh, when we were in Singapore, the, I, I told you that the speech therapist asked if we told someone about his condition. And, uh, you know, the baby photos that we kept, he brought it to school. And he went in front of his class and he shared it with his classmates. Wow. Uh-huh. Okay. And this classmates, oh, this is what you look like then when you're a baby. And, you know, they asked him questions and he answered, you know, confidently saying, oh, this. And he was proud that, oh, you know, I went into surgery. I did, you know, I got this done. I, I got this done. I love yeah. it. Mm -hmm. So, so um, d did he suffer from a lot of bullying or was he okay because he was the one who always brought it to the table and was the one that created the space for the conversation? Uh, I, I think he was, he was okay. He was okay. I think maybe mainly because uh, support from, from the Abang, he has three Abangs, right? And, and uh, from, from the whole family, actually. It is, and the thing is, you need to instill positive uh, positive in, uh, attitudes in, in your child so that they can carry uh, themselves well when they go to school because uh, I know there are cases that kids get teased in school maybe they just want to get to know them they don't know the condition so I guess uh, when he was in Singapore him going in front of his class to share about his condition help him help build him his confidence more yeah, and also because uh, I think bullying happens because Kids don't know. And yeah. They, they just mean. But then, because your son just went up and said, look, this is how it is. This is what happened to me. Yeah. It's just because more fascinating for everybody. And All right. Yeah. I, I think so. It's like, it's like, you can't bully me. I'm not ashamed of anything. Yeah, exactly. So, uh -huh. power there. So, let me just ask you about something that perhaps is a little bit sensitive, but completely pertinent to this, is that your long route and your son's long journey with having all of these operations just so that he could... Uh, you know, have access to his potential would have cost a heck of a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, how challenging was it for you as a family um, financially and in your work now in, in sort of being part of the support group, would you say that that's one of the bigger challenges that parents have to face is actually not so much what hap happens with the child, but with the financial burden of it all? Oh. We, we were lucky then because the company that my husband works for uh, had it all covered under insurance. Wow. Uh -huh, we were very lucky. So um, his, uh, his uh, first two surgeries in, in KL was covered by insurance. When, when, uh, when uh, in uh, Washington, it was also it was covered, uh, fully covered by the, by the insurance. Um, so we, we didn't have uh, much uh, financial burden per se, but uh, for the current situation, uh, the parents they have the option of going to the government hospital, which is the the treatment that is highly subsidized by the government. So if you are a government servant, you just need to bring a G, a letter from stating that you are working uh, with the government, and they you get it free. Your your child will be treated free. But uh, as for me, if I were to go there, uh, there uh, they will charge minimal. Uh, you know, an example, when uh, you have to do lip or palate surgery, let's say at uh, Hospital Kuala Lumpur, mm -hmm. the charge will range between uh, 100 to 200 ringgit only. That's a charge to the parents. The, the, the actual cost of the surgery is about four 5,000, but that is being absorbed by the government. But if they choose to go to a teaching hospital, there are teaching hospitals like UM, mm -hmm. uh, USM and UKM, they do uh, CLEF corrective surgeries as well. That would range between uh, 1,000 to 2,000 ringgit. Uh, but if parents choose to go to a private setting, then it will cost all do anywhere between 5 to 15, 20k per surgery. So for a CLEF lip and palate, sorry? Like Going public, going to a public hospital or government mm. hospital, mm. you have to wait a long time, don't you? No, no. 
Not not really, not anymore. Because in the olden days, yes. Uh, in the olden days, yes, because they don't have many surgeons. But nowadays, uh, we see we see that babies get done at, at the right age. Because, you know, for lead, it has to be done between the age of three mm -hmm. to six months. So when we ask around those who get treatment at government hospital, they get it done within that age period. Okay. But of late, because of COVID, it gets delayed because the hospitals cannot cope uh, because it's an elective surgery, right? So uh, Clef get put aside for now. What we heard uh, from, a, from an, another from, person. From, uh, yeah, from, from uh, another doctor the, that basically there was a problem in terms of um, the waiting list for the operations with the government side and that's actually was causing issues and and why some um, some kids and adults actually didn't get their operations done that, that, that was then that was years ago when you say then you're talking like 20 years ago yeah, or yeah. 10, uh -huh. 10, 20 okay. years ago yeah got it okay because yeah. since um, I think maybe uh, 5 to 10 years maybe 5 years back the the government has improved their services mm -hmm. and they have more surgeons in the hospitals because uh, we do sponsor Clapham do sponsor cases all over Malaysia so when we look at the cases and oh, okay this is lip surgery when we ask the mom how is the baby is is within the range okay and those who say it's delayed when we ask it's due to health reason when the baby was supposed to come in he had fever, was coughing, had sneezing. All oh, so, right, so there were so other got, factors yes. involved. Got uh -huh. it. Okay. Uh -huh. so, so listen, so Rani, you're you're amazing. I mean, your story, your son's story is amazing. But I'd like to ask you something, sort of, I guess, retrospective, which is, uh -huh. you know, it's never easy as a parent to sort of help a child that's a little bit different, just uh -huh. because of the different needs that aren't so normally or readily available, right? Yeah. As you've experienced. Um, and also it's hard for a kid to walk that sort of path as well. Yeah. So what would you say, what would you have wished or wanted to have heard when you were a new parent with your new baby that looked very different? Mm -hmm. And what do you say to kids, for example, who are facing um, bullying or, or difficult situations? Um, you know, back then I, I wish I, I knew more about the the things that you need to follow the CLEF protocol then because I was learning as I you know I went along so that would help a lot L like what we share with parents uh, during counseling is we walk them through the process and they will ah, it's from now until adult is a long process you know but Mm -hmm. uh, but then again, we will emphasize, but for now, you will need to concentrate on feeding the baby first, getting the baby's weight up, you know, and getting them ready for surgery. But we share this so that you know that it's a long journey. So it's good if they can just stay with the same team. Because there's, there's a tendency for parents to jump from one hospital to another because, oh, I can't wait there because it's taking too long, stuff like that, you know. So they like to move around with which doesn't help. Okay, so, so it's good to stay with the same team. And for the children, uh, actually, it goes back to the parents. The parents need to instill uh, inside them uh, to be tough. And the parents need to explain to them the conditions so that they know. So that when they go to school, when the friends uh, say, hey, why you look like that? Why your lip is like that? They, they have an answer to give. You know, like, like what Salman did. Right. So the, the parents need to educate the children so that the children will be more prepared. And what would you say to parents who perhaps a mom who's got postpartum and then having to deal with that on top of, you know, recognizing that your child is different or, or, or a dad who's really struggling to understand and, and, you know, just be confused. Like what would you say yeah. to parents who are really struggling? Oh, we, we have a lot of those cases. <laughs> Recently, there was one dad who came to get the board because, because of COVID, we don't visit, uh, we don't do hospital visits. Mm. Uh, we just post the bottle to them. But uh, this case was from Shah Alam. So I gave them an option. You can come to my house and you can, I can have a chat with you. And so the baby was like a week old already. When I asked the, the dad, 
uh, what type of cleft is it? What? How does baby look like? I don't know. I didn't go see the baby because I cannot go in uh, uh, because the baby was in an ICU. Mm -hmm. but it's the, that indifference uh, to me because it's denial on his part because he, I think he still cannot accept the fact that he has a clear baby. Right. So it's, it's quite sad actually. Yeah, mm -hmm. the fear. and mm -hmm. uh, But he doesn't want to say that he don't know what to do because he's like very macho kind of guy. Of course. Uh, so... And I pity uh, because when I asked, don't you, didn't your wife tell you what the baby looked like? Oh, I don't know. Uh, my wife had cesarean section, so maybe sh she was still blur and, you know. <laughs> but that was a week already, you know. <laughs> all so all what, these kind of excuses doesn't help. So what would you say to parents who are struggling? For whatever the reason is, whatever the mm -hmm. struggle is, mm -hmm. what's the one thing you'd like them to think about or just hold on to? That um, you think will make all the difference? No, usually what, what I do is I, I would usually share the photos of Salman, the before and the after, mm -hmm. you know, and other children that because I have um, quite a selection. So, you know, if your baby is like this, it will be like this, but it's a long process and you will have to have a lot of patience. And you, the first thing is you have to accept it. You know, if you cannot accept your baby's condition, you will not have the love to take care of the baby. You know, it will be very indifferent to, to the baby. That, that's, that's what I think. So the first step acceptance. is acceptance. acceptance. Yes, yeah. acceptance. Because if you keep denying, it cannot happen to me because we have seen cases that the couple get, get separated. In fact, sometimes some of them get divorced because they were blaming each other. It's your fault. It's your fault. And, you know, it doesn't help the baby. Right. Okay. So you have to accept, yeah. And as a team, husband and wife as a team.